taxes. Two years ago, she quit her job and went to India to work on her passion to create sustainable rural areas. There, she enrolled in National Institute for Rural Development, known as NIRDPR, to gain knowledge on rural empowerment techniques. Subsequently, she adopted 40 villages. She is currently back in USA, working on raising awareness in the NRI community. Ms. Cynthia Parala, the platform is all yours. Thank you so much, Tiny. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I would like to request everyone to please mute yourselves. And uh, before we go ahead and get started, I want to see if we have all the speakers. I know this is Naini's first time to be a moderator and she's doing a great job and uh, I'm helping her out. So um, do we have all the speakers today? I see five, yes. And I request all the speakers so. to... Yes, I request all the speakers to please uh, switch on your video cameras when you're speaking. Uh, and if you have any presentations, uh, some of you have already submitted it to us and we will definitely go ahead and present them if you have already uh, submitted it to us. But if not, do let us know, you can ask us and we will make you a co-host and we will give you the presenting rights. Um, I see five of you all, the speakers. Thank you for joining. And the rest of them all also are here. So, okay, thank you so much Naini for that introduction. Uh, that was a beautiful introduction and uh, it's uh, sometimes good to hear uh, praises from your own daughter's mouth. So that said, uh, I am Cynthia Padala and uh, I have adopted 40 villages in Andhra and Telangana in India. And uh, today's topic is about women in STEM, but we wanted to start with girls in STEM because girls when empowered and when guided, truly they become the women that can hone and uh, not just a family, but an entire country. So it's not about my story, but it's about story of everyone else out there who are inspiring, who are inspiring others to become empowered. And this year's um, motto is uh, choose to challenge, which is very apt. 2020 has been a challenging year for us all. Even though 2020 was so different and it was so uh, full of challenges and hardships and people losing their jobs and a lot of things unexpected. But when you look back at that 2020, and see it as a movie. Don't you feel that you have achieved, accomplished a lot in that one year? Life has thrown us so many unexpected um, activities, so many unexpected events into our lives, but we chose to be resilient. We as women, we as girls chose to adapt. We, we also chose to not just to adapt, but to identify uh, situations or techniques that will empower us to become successful. So that is what today's meeting is all about, is to talk about how you or anyone, a girl or a woman has overcome those challenges. Of course, for me to adopt 40 villages in India was not an easy thing. I come from a city, I was born and raised in city, but understanding rural problems and then going there and implementing solutions that we think are right for them, but do they know that they are right for them? So these are all the challenges that I faced, but I did not give up. So also I want to understand from you all, this platform is to empower you, girls especially, we want to start, I said with girls, we want to empower you all to tell your stories to us, to the world, saying that, hey, we are not weak. We are strong. We are stronger than you think, than you know. And we choose to challenge. We choose to challenge all that has happened in the previous year and that all that will be coming towards us. Not just us girls and women in the developed countries, but also developing and underdeveloped countries have their own stories. 
and we want to showcase those stories. So without further ado, I want to welcome you all, young girls, future women, future entrepreneurs, future STEM leaders, and future social impactors. We don't know what the future lies for you, but what you choose today is what you are going to become tomorrow. So choose it right. And by presenting whatever you are doing today is going to give us hope and other girls outside the world, outside this um, US or any other community to see that, yes, you are a beacon leader for them. And this is how you have accomplished your um, goals. It may be small, it may be big, but whatever you have done, you have set up a plan. You have reached, you have set up some goals, mini goals in between that goals, how to accomplish it. And you worked towards it and you became successful. So what is that success story? We want to hear that and we want to inspire. So when you are presenting all the five girls that are in front of me today, I want to speak to you all. It's not for the audience, but you all saying that you are presenting to the entire world. Just understand that you are already a beacon leader. You are setting an example. So when your life is in front of everyone, it will be scrutinized. Don't be afraid of it. It will be, people will call you down. People will pull you down. Don't be challenged by it. Don't be discouraged by it. But identify new ways to become a better person, a better uh, successful, whatever path you choose. And that's what we want to hear. So again, I say that when you're presenting, keep that in mind that you are already a beacon leader. So welcome everyone. And the platform is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cynthia Padala, for your empowering words. Next, I will be giving a brief introduction on AVS Academy. AVS Academy is an online college prep academy that focuses on developing persuasive leadership skills through effective communication. It was founded by Mr. Karen Pella, who came to US in 1992 and completed his master's from New York Institute of Technology, an MBA from Northern Illinois University. He is also the recipient of United States Presidential Service Award. Under his guidance, more than 1,100 students went through college preparation and are currently in 69 universities in USA, UK, and India. For our first speaker, we will be having Chaita Revola. She's a sophomore at Carnegie Vanguard High School. Her topic will be about outer space exploration. Wait, um, do you guys have my presentation? Yes, Charita. Okay. Um, so give, give me one second. I'm gonna start presenting. So I have Hansika's presentation, which is my experience in FLL, but I'm not sure if I have yours, but I can make you the co-host Charita and you can go ahead and present yourself, okay? You are the co-host now. You can share your screen. There's a green button at the bottom yeah. of your screen. Yes. Just click on that. Um, okay. Oh. It'll give you some options. It will present a larger screen and yes, just select your presentation and you should be able to present it. Um, are you able to see this? 
Not yet. No. Um... Did you click share at the bottom? Yeah, but um... you have to also. All right, just send it to me in the WhatsApp link and I will uh, take a look at it. Or uh, please send it to Kiran Palla also, Mr. Kiran Palla also at the same time. There are technical glitches all the time, but that shouldn't discourage us. This Padala, if you're okay with it, uh, we can switch up the order a little bit. And while Charita is figuring that out, I can go. Yes, that's a great suggestion, Sanjana. I like it. Please go ahead. Um, before we do that, yes, Naini, can you please introduce Sanjana? So while Charita is fixing her presentation, our next speaker will be Sanjana Pulaparthi. She's a sophomore at Westboro High School. Her topic is about neurological diseases in underdeveloped countries. Thank you, Naini, for that wonderful introduction. Hello, everybody. As Naini already said, my name is Sanjana Pulaparthi, and I've been a part of AVS Academy for almost a year now, and I feel very lucky to be able to present today. So for that, I would like to thank Mrs. Padala and obviously Mr. Karen Pala for giving us this amazing opportunity and this amazing platform to share our stories and the research we've done and present ourselves on the eve of Women's Day. My topic that I have researched thoroughly is about neurological diseases and disorders in underdeveloped countries. So this issue of mental illness is a major global health issue that is present all around the globe. It's not just underdeveloped countries, but these neurological diseases are seen very visibly in high income countries, such as the US or Canada or the UK, but often are hidden in low and middle income countries. These underdeveloped countries, contrary to popular belief, have populations that are still suffering from Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, depression, schizophrenia, PTSD, and so much more. But LMICs, which is the abbreviation for lower and middle income countries, don't have the resources to take on the healthcare challenges of their populations. However, improving public health is not solely dependent on resource availability. It is a big part, but it's not the only part. Increasing awareness about mental health issues is something that can result in a higher outreach for help. When the problem is identified, a solution can be derived. When the problem itself is hidden, it's impossible to get to the root of how we can solve this problem that is huge all over the world. The focus of many experts now is turning towards cost-effective methods to get these resources out. Even though we may be able to provide certain resources for these countries, ultimately they may be too expensive because the fact that they're underdeveloped and the poor population of the underdeveloped countries, which is our focus, won't have the money or the availability to these resources just because they can't afford it. So cost effectiveness is huge. In Zimbabwe, a, a doctor named Dixon Chibanda created a resource called the Friendship Bench. In 2018, this revolutionized the lives of the Zimbabweans at the time. The process went as such. Older women within the community were chosen as counselors and trained to be mental health helpers. In this way, people could have sessions with these older citizens on the so-called friendship benches of their communities and talk freely about their mental health. Oftentimes, there's also a language barrier, which was ultimately fixed through this initiative. 400 grandmothers, as they were called, were trained across Zimbabwe, impacting about 40,000 people in a total of 70 Zimbabwean communities. The most important uh, aspect of this, again, the giveaway that we want through this entire presentation is that this was extremely cost effective. It affected a lot of people and it was readily available and very affordable. Moving on to another branch of this issue, cost effectiveness is very important, but in our modern day, based on our modern, modern day technology, 
We know that research suggests that the best way to battle neurological diseases is prevention. Mental health and depression, it can be set aside as a separate category, and we can look at neurological diseases as the things that really affect the biology of the brain. Meditation, contrary to popular belief, isn't just a method of relaxation. In fact, studies have shown that meditation may be able to prevent and alleviate symptoms of many neurological diseases. Practicing meditation for long periods of time can help reduce cortisol levels in the brain. Cortisol is a stress hormone that affects your parasympathetic nervous system. And just a brief overview about what those words mean. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system uh, mobilizes your energy in times of stress to prep you for whatever the stressor is. Your heart rate gets higher, uh, adrenaline pumps into your veins. So that is what the sympathetic nervous system does. The counterpart to that is the parasympathetic, and this part of your body makes sure that you don't stay in that acute stress period for too long. Staying at that stress period for too long messes with the biology of your brain. Neurotransmitters like cortisol get rapidly increased and stay increased, and this can actually have permanent effects on your memory and learning capacities. In diseases like Alzheimer's, where stress can play a huge role in damaging more neurons, being able to control cortisol levels can be helpful in making sure the neuronal degeneration isn't aggravated. And through meditation, this can be attained. Controlling and being in control of your own brain and your own body can make sure that these neurological diseases don't further faster than you want them to. In a study done in 2018 with epileptic patients, 19 out of 20 epileptic patients reported reduced frequency in seizures after doing three to six months of meditation and yogic practices. Epileptic patients have constant seizures and it interferes with their day-to-day -day lives on a very rigorous scale. And these seizures are basically caused by the overfiring of neurons in your brain. Usually all of us throughout the day and even when we sleep, neurons are always firing. But in epileptic patients, they have rapidly firing, misfiring neurons that make them have these seizures. While and when these people meditated, what happened was that the meditation induced relaxation and released inhibitory neurotransmitters such as GABA that reduced the firing in their neurons. With the reductioning of the firing, the seizures were alleviated as well. Meditation has also proven to improve conditions of major depression by regulating other biological factors in the brain. So based on much research done by scientists globally, preventive methods such as meditation and cost-effective methods being implemented in underdeveloped countries is a major step in improving public health. And on a final note, again, I would just like to thank Sarah Trust and AVS Academy for giving me this wonderful opportunity to present my research. And I am looking forward to listening to everybody else present about their wonderful topics as well. Thank you once again. Thank you, Sanjana, for your wonderful presentation. It really opened our eyes to the neurological diseases around the world, especially in underdeveloped countries. And um, I think Chaita Revela is ready, so if she wants to go ahead, she can, or yeah, but should I? Yes, uh, that was an amazing uh, presentation, uh, Sanjana. So I just, uh, this is something very unusual for a uh, topic for others, like third world countries, because they don't focus or address neurological diseases. They think it's a uh, taboo to talk about it. So I want to see uh, if you're okay, and open up the forum for five minutes for anyone if, he if they have any questions uh, or want to converse with uh, Sanjana. Uh, hi, good morning everyone. This is Vijay. I am grandfather of uh, Hansika. It's a wonderful presentation. Uh, I appreciate you know the research which you heard and at this young age. God bless you. 
is a good uh, presentation right good luck thank you thank you so much thank you sir thank you we definitely need encouragement anyone else so uh, i have a question i think uh, we are getting few questions offline too um there are few questions did you do any research on uh, because our women our rural women are working on some products which are essential oils and aromatherapy and their um, effect on neurological diseases have you gotten any opportunity to work on those yet i haven't gotten an opportunity to work specifically on those although that that sounds like an amazing initiative and that is something that i will definitely delve into deeper uh i've heard of other uh natural resources and natural methods that people have implemented and helped implement into these underdeveloped countries and i think based off of that i would like to say a few things in that these underdeveloped countries have cultures of their own and asking them to adapt so much into our own culture or like use our methods i don't think is fair and many people agree with this it's that you need to be able to understand their needs and help them in a way that works for them rather than just thinking that this works for us so it's going to work for them so natural resources and things like aromatherapy sound like amazing things that came out of their own culture so making sure that we support them in their own Uh, endeavors to make their lives better is i think very important and that sounds like an amazing topic i think that is something that i will definitely learn about more and research about more awesome awesome thank you so much sanjana yes naini it's all yours now our next presentation speaker will be sanjana i mean uh, sorry uh, chaita yeah um is the presentation being shared or um i can't see the presentation but uh okay. now i can see it okay um good morning everyone i hope everyone is having a good morning i guess um so like i said our like Naini said earlier i am charita rabula um i'm a sophomore at carnegie vanguard high school in houston texas and before i start my talk on outer space i'd like to recount my experiences from avs academy and i think it's a really good um i guess program i've definitely been able to um i guess broaden my um i guess just my interests as i was originally um interested in medicine but this academy helped me realize that i was more interested in stem and i think it's a good program for everyone as there is something for everyone and i've been able to gain more leadership experience as well and so i will be talking to you guys about outer space um Okay, so um just to get a quick overview, there are three main branches under space exploration, and they are astrophysics, astronomy, and cosmology. Astrophysics is a branch under astronomy that deals with the laws of physics and chemistry to explain the birth, life, and death of stars, planets, galaxies, and other objects in the universe. Astronomy is a natural science that studies celestial objects and phenomena. So when it comes to astrophysicists and astronomers, astrophysicists are more focused on the history of the universe and how it has evolved, whereas astronomers concentrate on studying specific things in the universe such as a planet or a star. Or okay. Moving on, Cosmology is a branch of astronomy that deals with the studies of the origin and evolution of the universe as a whole. To sum things up, astrophysics and cosmology are both under astronomy, um and the line between the three is very blurry, but they are still distinct fields. So, the history of space exploration. 
The history of space exploration didn't necessarily kick off until the Cold War. The Cold War was a period of great political hostility between the US and the Soviet Union and lasted about 45 years. The two nations were fighting to produce powerful missiles that were capable of transporting nuclear weapons between continents. In 1957, the Soviet Union um, launched the first artificial um, satellite, Sputnik. Several months later, they launched the first ever living organism into space, a dog named Laika. The first human in space was Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. And not long after, NASA was able to launch Alan Shepard into a suborbital trajectory around Earth. In 1962, President John F. Kennedy gave his historic speech about landing a man on the moon at Rice University in Houston, Texas, hence why Houston is known as the Space City. Um, in 1969, on Apollo 11, NASA sent the first astronauts to the moon and Neil Armstrong became the first man to set foot on its surface. Several years later, NASA started sending out space probes to study the planets Venus, Mars, and Mercury. So the Cold War space race between the United States and the Soviet Union came to an end in the 1990s. Today, the landscape is very different with various countries involved in current and future space missions. Currently, there are over 70 different government and intergovernmental space agencies. 13 of these have space launch capabilities, including NASA, the European Space Agency, the Russian Federal Space Agency, and the China National Space Administration. However, government space agencies are only a portion of the story when it comes to 21st century space travel. Plenty of commercial companies are also developing space, space flight capabilities, including SpaceX, founded by Elon Musk, and Blue Origin, founded by Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos. Recently, like I think two weeks ago, NASA landed a rover by the name of Perseverance on Mars. And Perseverance will be looking for any signs of life or signs that life even existed in a region of Mars where scientists believe is ideal for microscopic life. NASA also plans to send the first woman to the moon in 2024. So why am I personally interested in outer space? I'm interested in the space field because it's honestly really fascinating. Humans have always been curious about the unknown and I think I just got caught up in that wave of curiosity. I also became really interested in outer space between 2017 and 2018. I watched a show on Netflix called Voltron that was about these five teenagers from Earth who helped fight aliens and protect the universe. I really enjoy the animation as well as the show itself, and it made me really curious about outer space. I was also able to discover my love for space exploration through several television channels, such as the History Channel and the SciGo Channel. They always played episodes of shows on our universe and extraterrestrial life. I think another factor would be how I've spent 11 years of my life living in Houston, which like I mentioned earlier, is known as a space city. I think I was just honestly unknowingly influenced by the vast history of um, Houston. I overall really enjoy thinking about the millions of possibilities in our universe, such as the many planets and galaxies that could exist. And I'm also really curious about figuring out if we're really not alone in the universe and if potential aliens are intelligent or not. So um, just to wrap things up, that concludes my little talk about um, outer space exploration, as well as my personal interest in it. Thank you to both Cynthia Chi and Mr. Karen Fala for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Chaita, for your presentation on outer space. I also loved how you were open-minded and explored more paths instead of healthcare, and you found something that you liked. If you have any questions, if anyone has questions, you can um, unmute and ask them now. Yes, thank you, Cheta. My younger daughter, she is seven year old and she loves space. 
and we actually watched the perseverance landing very closely so how did how was your experience on that well i was actually busy that day so i wasn't able to watch it but um actually later today i'm planning on rewatching it and also um my little sister is also really interested in outer space too hmm nice nice yeah um so what do you think you know is our future on mars um i think it definitely could be possible but the um conditions on mars are kind of difficult cuz it tends to be really hot during the day and it gets really cold at night so it's kind of like a desert mhm mm yeah that's true yeah so anyone else who has any questions or suggestions or encourage charita yeah charita is a wonderful uh, presentation again okay uh, interesting collection so this you know these presentations and all the information the way you are moving and all the youngsters and young girls uh, that is increasing our you know promise in the future the world is in the safe hands of uh, you youngsters we are very happy to know about this is the uh, one technical question is mars closure or a uh, uh, moon is closer to us oh the moon is definitely closer to us which one the moon. moon oh i see then why we are not thinking of uh, settling in moon then why you are focusing on mars uh, um i think mars just has better conditions than the moon wow <laughs> okay good <laughs> okay then. thank you very much again another good presentation thank, thank you. you bye yeah. thank you sir definitely you are an adding flavor to our presentations uh, keep it going <laughs> mr j um yeah. I, I, uh, apart from my comments is i worked in this uh, you know in india's uh, drdls programs okay i was a fortunate guy to work in association with this uh, dr prabhu kalam mm, okay when he was the director of drdl yeah that is a small information about me now i am leading a retired life thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you thank you all right naini it's all yours again Okay, we now have our next speaker, Hansika Chenamsadi. She is from Maryland and goes to Dunlogan Middle School. She will be talking about her experiences in FLL, or otherwise known as First Lego League, robotics. Thank you, Naini. So as Naini said, um, my name is Hansika Chenamsadi. I go to Dunlogan Middle School. Uh, I live in Howard County, Maryland. So I'd first like to thank AVS Academy, Sarah Trust, Mr. Karen and Ms. Cynthia for giving me this opportunity to talk. I've been in Avius Academy for a couple of months now, and it has greatly helped me with uh, my research skills and public speaking skills. So, um, do you have my presentation, Ms. Cynthia? Yes, ma'am. Let me know if you can see. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Um, so I will be talking about my experiences in FLL. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? A few seconds. Thank you. Left. So F, uh, what is FLL? So FLL is a hands-on learning STEM project and global robotics program, um, which involves a group effort in solving real problems to build a better future together. There are three components in this program, core values, inspiration, and, uh, sorry, core values, research project, and the robot design. So core values is basically how your team works together. That includes inspiration, teamwork, and gracious professionalism, which is just a fancy way of saying valuing and respecting others. For the research project, we have to research a problem, find an innovative solution, and present it. And then for the robot design, we build a Lego robot and it completes missions on a map. So for that, we have to look at the strategy and innovation, programming and mechanical design. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So for the core values, like I said, it's how your team works together. So that includes brainstorming for a team name. Uh, we came up with the innovative ambassadors, also breaking up tasks for each person based on their skills, 
coordinating with everyone's availability, meeting up after school hours and many weekends, looking at what failed and what can be improved, uh, resolving on the spot problems and building strategies together. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, for our research project, every year we are given a broad topic to research within. And our topic was called City Shaper, which is basically about the construction of a city. So our problem was that in Howard County, Maryland, out of the 40 existing parks, there are no playgrounds designed for 6,160 students in our county with special needs. And the special needs students get agitated very easily, so playgrounds help them calm down. So our solution was to incorporate ramps and padded grounds, wheelchair accessible swings, fidgeting fidgeting equipment, feeling graphs, low raised monkey bars, cocoon type structures, and music that changes based on your pulse. And then on the next slide, um, can, sorry, can, thank you. Um, you can see we included ramps for um, the wheelchairs and swings and slides, and musical notes. And so our main goal was to create a playground to promote interaction between children with or without cognitive and sensory disorders. Um, um, Miss Cynthia, you're not presenting this. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, can you go to, okay, thank you. So for this research project, we talked to many people, the principal of a special needs and disabled children's school, and even our own science teacher who has a daughter with Down syndrome. So we also talked to the manager, director, and superintendent of the Therapeutic Recreation and Park Center. And we also went to a special education citizens advisory committee and um, they really liked our ideas for this playground. So they're building one currently in Howard County called Bland Air Park and it's an inclusive playground for everyone. Um, and then for the next slide. So that was our research project. And then, so this is, uh, about the robot design. So this is kind of like the big part of the, the whole program. And it's basically where we build a Lego robot, which completes tasks, avoids obstacles on the mat while gaining points. And there are a lot of things to take in play while designing for it. You have to look at the stability, reliability, place for attachments and adaptation to complex codes. And then on the next slide, um, you can see these are the sensors. So the gyro sensor measures the rate and rotation and angle in degrees. The color sensors detects the color or intensity of light. The ultrasonic sensors measure the distance to um, an object of a robot. And then the next slide show the, sorry, can you switch to the next slide? Thank you. The, large motors and medium motors. And these are for the wheels of the robot. So they have a rotation sensor, which measures how far a motor has turned. Also, there's an infrared beacon or an infrared transmitter, which is basically like a remote control that holds all of the codes for this robot. Um, so I was the main lead for the design. And once I put everything together, um, that was our design. Yeah, sorry, the next slide. Uh, the, the next slide shows our uh, robot. So it's called the roller coaster robot. And you can see the frame that is moving. It has um, Lego pieces attached to it so that it can complete codes and missions on the map. And then um, on the next slide, uh, can you switch? Okay, thank you. So this is a piece of our code. And on the mat, which we put the robot in, um, it has many black and white lines. So this code is basically telling the robot to keep going until it reaches a black and white line. And how it's doing that is using all the color sensors. And so the color sensor is in the shape of a circle. And if you look at it from a bird's eye view, it is perfectly on 50% white and 50% black. And if the robot malfunctions or accidentally turns, it automatically corrects itself. And that's what makes the robot go in a precise line. Um, on, and then on the next slide. Uh, so this is about the competition day. 
for the core values, we were put in a room and they designed, they asked us to design a mall. So all the judges watched everyone contribute and listen to other people's ideas. For the robot design inspection, uh, we played a program and explained our codes and strategies on the table. For the actual robot competition, we had two minutes and 30 seconds to do the courses and three rounds to run the whole mission. At the end, the judges added up our points and compared it with the other teams. So for each of these, we were graded um, on four categories, beginning, developing, accomplished, and exemplary. So we ended up scoring an accomplished and exemplary for all of them. Also for the competition for regionals, there were 400 teams and 90 teams qualified for states. Um, on the next slide, for the competition day, there were Roman judges who saw how we tackled problems together, worked under pressure, resolved problems in less than a couple of minutes, and saw what to do if something went wrong. So we ended up winning first place in project award and third place in robot design and um, qualified for states. So overall, it was a very, very fun experience. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Hansika, for your experience, for sharing your experiences in FLL. Um, I also used to be in FLL as well, and my team only had two girls, and I was one of them. So it's great to see that there are more girls joining robotics. If anyone, has, yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can ask. This is not a question, but I would just like to say uh, good job on like your project. I'm also in FLL. This is my third year doing it. And I'm the like the only girl in my team. So seeing that many other people are doing it really makes me happy. And I like how you like described everything. It was really cool. What was your favorite part about doing FOL? Um, first of all, it's so cool that you did FOL. And uh, so my favorite part was probably working together as a team to complete the codes and designs for the robot. I think it was really cool how we looked at all aspects, what what could work and what would go wrong. Thank you. Amazing, amazing presentation, Hansika. Yes, please go ahead. Someone was about to say something. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm, it's, I'm yes, Mr. Yeah, uh, good presentation, Hansika. What are the immediate applications you are seeing? Uh, I'm, in fact, you know, I'm also impressed, you know, the way you are exploring into the robots. Okay, that's, you know, definitely it has got an immediate applications, especially in a where the uh, labor is very costly. Okay, and where, you know, disasters, you know, do happen where, you know, a, a human beings cannot approach. These are the immediate applications, which, so what are the immediate, uh, what are the, uh, you know, immediate applications you are visualizing, uh, which, you know, helps uh, maybe the US even and the other, the other countries. Yeah, so the park we're building um, in Howard County, it's called Blander Park, and it's for it's for all like special needs kids, also for um, other kids as well. So it could help people all around the world. Good. So that's your application part. Go ahead, Mr. Vijay. All right, I think that was yes. Uh, so that's uh, to add to what Mr. Vijay also mentioned about applications, right? Um, in third world countries, they don't have this knowledge, especially robotics and developing countries are barely getting into it. Uh, but at the same time, we see that women uh, or girls um, are very uh, less percentage in any of these STEM activities. To so to see you all in robotics especially is really encouraging and inspiring. So did you face any problems and how did you try to tackle them? Um, yes, we've faced many problems. I can give you an example. So uh, during the competition day, actually, one of the codes went wrong. So we played music notes in between to see where and when the, co the, the robot stopped working. And um, yeah, and yeah, we fixed it based on that. Okay, awesome, awesome. That's good. Great. So Naini, 
please go ahead. Okay, for our last speaker, we have Aishwarya Arike. She's from Los Angeles, California, and goes to River Heights Intermediate School. Her topic is about neonatology. Uh, that's a small correction. I need, we have two more speakers, last but one, oh, yeah. Aishwarya um, and Shreya, yes. But go ahead, Aishwarya. Well, Good morning. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Naini. My name is Aishwarya Urge, and I'm from Los Angeles, California. I'm in seventh grade, and I go to River Heights Intermediate School. Before I begin, I want to convey my special thanks to Mr. Kiran Pala, AVC Academy, and to Sierra Smart Villages for letting us have this opportunity. AVC Academy has helped me grow as a speaker and writer. I've noticed a difference in my vocabulary and confidence skills, so thank you. I'll be talking about neonatology and its history. Neonatology is a subspecialty of pediatrics that consists of the medical care of newborn infants, especially the ill or premature newborn. It is a hospital-based specialty and is usually practiced in neonatal intensive care units, or the NICU. Now, you might be wondering, who is involved in the development of neonatology? Pierre Constant Boudin was a pioneer in the care of at-risk newborn babies and dedicated his career to reducing infant mortality. He encouraged educating mothers about proper nutrition for their babies. Boudin also brought Davage, the process of feeding through a tube that went directly to the stomach to the, sur to the surgery to grow and gain weight. Tarnier recognized this and developed a crude isolate, a wooden box with a glass lid and a hot water bottle inside to put premature infants inside of. How big premature infants who were unable to feed properly received the nutrition they needed. Pierre started his career as an assistant to Etienne Stefan Tarnier another French obstetrician instrumental in the development of neonatal care. Now we'll be discussing incubators and the role they play in saving infants' life. Infants that are born too early are often incapable of producing their own heat and incubators help keep these babies warm and allow them to use their inside of a Charnier's work con contributed to a 28% decrease in infant mortality over three years at the French maternity hospital he worked in. Charnier's technology was picked up by a student of Boudin's, Martin County, who used considerably less conventional methods to help popularize special care for premature infants outside of France. At the turn of the century, many hospitals in both America and Europe did not allow technology such as incubators to be used within their walls. County, however, recognized the potential of incubators for helping premature babies. Dr. County offered this type of treatment for premature infants free of charge. How? It was paid for through admissions. Dr. County displayed the babies at, in a sideshow in Coney Island starting in 1903 and charged onlookers 25 cents a piece to come in and view the babies and the technology keeping them alive. Similar sideshows were set up in Europe as part of fairs and expositions, including the 1933 New York's World Fair and 1939 Chicago's World's Fair. Unfortunately, Dr. County died in 1950, shortly after American hospitals began to use incubators to care for premature babies. Doctors and scientists began writing on the care of premature and signal newborns as early as the 17th century. However, it was not until 300 years later that babies began to receive special care in hospitals. Until the mid 20th century, most of these infants were sent home without medical intervention. Occasionally, they would have a nurse come home with them. It was not until after World War II that hospitals began to create special care baby units, the predecessors to modern NICUs. As, there, as there's always room for imp improvement in every aspect, Dr. Julian Hess brought revolutionary changes to the incubators. The creation of special care units for infants was sparked by the realization of Dr. Hess that heat, humidity, and a steady supply of oxygen could increase the survival rates of sickly babies, meaning that hospitals could intervene to help babies live, as opposed to just sending them home without any treatment. Dr. Julian successfully implemented his enhanced incubator at the Reese Hospital in Chicago. The following decade, incubators with clear plastic walls were introduced, allowing doctors and nurses to easily see and access the babies. Now I'm gonna be speaking about infant infections. At this time, doctors were beginning to fully realize the danger that infection posed to newborns, especially premature babies. However, the way infection spread was severely misunderstood. It was thought that the biggest risk to a baby was another baby in the nursery. No one thought that a baby could get sick from a healthy adult. Dr. Lewis Gluck was instrumental in pro proving this line of thought wrong. Along with Subner Yaff, Norman Kretschmer, and Harold Simon, Gluck performed a series of experiments that involved two sets of babies. One washed daily, the other one's not. They would take cultures from both sets and compare them and it became evident very quickly that the washed babies had fewer pathogens. To show that the children had a low risk of catching diseases from each other, Gluck began keeping the washed and unwashed children in the same nursery. 
At the time, keeping more than one premature infant in one room was considered a risky idea. The difference in the health between the two groups became so apparent that nurses began washing all of the babies regularly. It was shown that regardless of nursery mates, a baby who was washed regularly was much less likely to become ill than one who wasn't. Gluck redesigned the special care nursery and encouraged the use of isolates and incubators all in one room, as opposed to keeping baby sec sections off in isolated cubicles. This allowed doctors, nurses, and other caretakers to easily access and tend to the babies. Gluck additionally designed the LS ratio test, which determined the maturity of an infant's lung and therefore their chances of de developing certain respiratory diseases. Now, there's a father of mathematics, there's a father of science, who's a father of neonatology, you might ask. Because of the accomplishments, Louis Gluck has, is often hailed as a father of neonatology. In recent years, the infant mortality rate has drastically reduced from 43.3% to 3.4% with the help of advancements. Survival without any major health complications has also increased. These increases show help for premature babies and their parents, and trends indicate that survival rates will rise even more in coming years. With increasing technology and awareness, survival for premature and sick infants is slowly turning from an exception into the standard. Thank you so much for listening. Nani, you are on mute. Can you please unmute yourself? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for your speech about neonatology. It's great to understand how doctors help premature newborn babies and how technology increased survival rates over the years. And um, if anyone has any questions, you can ask. Thank yeah, you, Ashley. My, my usual uh, this thing, interaction. is a very good uh, no, presentation. Uh, I really appreciate you know the various topics you know you are covering and wonderful information you are collecting. Uh, good show, Aishwarya. And uh, what is your uh, goal finally? What you want to become? You want to work in the same line? You want to do some research, or you have some other you know a similar topics you know at the back of your mind? Yeah. Um, thank you so much. First of all, but um, I want to become a neonatal surgeon. Um, cardiothoracic surgeon for neo, um, neonatology and yeah that's what I wanted good good and I'm sure that you will become okay god bless you thank you nice presentation thank you yeah that's all from me thank you sir so um last but not not the least thank you so much Aishwarya uh, for your presentation. Um, we have two minutes, but this might be a little bit uh, going over the scheduled time. We have uh, one more presenter. Uh, her name is Miss uh, Shruti Keshri. She is from Partner Women's College, and uh, she is studying Bachelors of Commerce. And her topic today is we are here to conquer the world. And that's what we need, women empowerment. Shruti, are you on the line? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, please go ahead, Shruti. It's all yours. Uh, uh, I need uh, the permission of sharing my screen. Sure. Let me make you a co-host. Yes, you are a co-host now, Shruti. You should be able to present. Uh, I hope it's visible to one and all. Is it? Yes, it is, Shruti. Uh, thank you. So, uh, first of all, a uh, very warm welcome and great regards to one and all present here. I am Shruti Keshri of Patna Women's College. I'm from India. And uh, my topic for today is uh, we are here to conquer the world. As, as a woman, uh, I think it's very important for us to lead the way because in, uh, in our society, there is a, there's probably a male, uh, male dominating society. So I think that uh, we should take lead and uh, we should start something uh, that uh, we want to, we want to do. And uh, so, yeah, let's hear, I can, I will start. Uh, 
so first of all a very happy women's day to every woman out there according to me being a woman was never easy and will never be you can put a woman in any situation and she will get rid of that in the simplest way she can there are many opportunities for women in different field or we can say that nowadays there are no field where we will not find a woman the ratio may vary according to preferences but women are entering the new world with full dignity and hard work women are the best fighter the best protector and the best savior the sky is not limited my friend we have so much to do in single life talking as women as an entrepreneur women entrepreneur may be defined as a group of women or a woman to initiate organize and run a business concern the organize uh, they organize and combine factors of production operates the enterprise and undertake risk handle economic uncertainty involved in running it in fact world over one third of entrepreneurial venture are run by women due to economic progress better access to education urbanization spread of liberals and democratic culture and recognition by society on the other hand there has been a drop in women entrepreneur teams like startup india as i belong to india and india stand up also make a special case to promote entrepreneurial dibra uh driven among women now i will let you meet with some special women on this special day she is dr a lalita india's first woman electrical engineer from being a teen widow with a four month old daughter to care for to becoming india's first woman electrical engineer A Lalita's life is nothing short of an inspiration as she was born on August 27 1919 in Madras Chennai uh, from very beginning she has her interest in learning about more and technology science now let's take an example of madam tz walker i hope uh, some of you will be known to her uh let's uh, she was the first independent woman entrepreneur madam cz walker uh is she was an entrepreneur to break through the norm since then the time has changed and women are on a remarkable journey of entrepreneurship and leading with the positive belief and confidence from being homemakers to successful entrepreneurs women in india have come a long way talking about india and not talking about kalpana saroj will not do the justice the first woman entrepreneur of india she is also known as plum dog millionaire kalpana saroj became the first woman entrepreneur of india she bought the distress asset of kamini tubes company and successfully started the company back to profit she proved that the dreams can only turn into reality when we work hard today inspired by her many women entrepreneur in india are emerging to success According to the sixth economic census released by Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, highlights that women constitute around fourteen percent of total entrepreneurship in India. India is seeing a revolution concerned women entrepreneurs. Now we all know new ideas led us to new ways. If you are an engineer and you are an entrepreneur already, you most likely have a number of skills to be an entrepreneur. Coming from your craft as an engineer, for example. numeracy and mathematical skills data and critical analysis skill becoming a female entrepreneur is facing a problem that is both challenging to understand and solve as at your work you analyze develop evaluate large scale complex system of problem uh, this can mean improving and maintaining current system or creating brand new project This process is remarkably similar to entrepreneurship, but the solving of this problem is done by business planning, which help you dissect your assets. Yeah. As we all know, difficult roads lead to beautiful destination. It is said by Jenry Kelly, founder of uh, founder and CEO of Bubble Gum, "Don't you overthink. Take the corrected risk." and you don't have to ask for permission to succeed it is not a rocket science don't be blinded by technical jargon and don't be afraid just ask a plenty of stupid question because asking question led us to our way 
well that's it by my side thank you and a happy women's day everyone thank you so much shruti uh, you gave us a different perspective of an entirely different country and uh, so yes definitely you have inspired us a uh, quick question to you is you spoke about we can do anything and especially about women entrepreneurs um why did you pick that topic do you want to because, be an entrepreneur uh, uh yes ma'am it is one of my dream because i don't want to stay beyond the limit in my college i'm uh, i'm learning this thing uh, this is uh, there is a topic that is my g subject that is entrepreneurship and uh, i really i am fascinated by this uh, topic and i think women can achieve anything if we want uh, if we have that level of potential and we just need a little boom that can let us do whatever we want and i really i am very fascinating towards this topic and i think this is a very nice topic okay good but uh, so do you have any do you, have you set any goals to become an entrepreneur at what timeline 5 yeah. years 10 years uh it will Can take you... time i have not uh, something specific for that but yeah i will look forward to that okay awesome awesome okay thank you so much shruti one more time uh last but yeah naini can you please go ahead with the last part of the agenda um, i will be announcing the certificates yes so can everyone please mute yourselves and we want to present uh, virtual certificates to everyone uh, who participated today in our webinar if you all can see my screen we can see your screen okay okay so basically uh, today we wanted to encourage inspire uh, other especially girls and women to present their ideas and also to present their life experiences and thank you so much for volunteering and coming forward uh and uh, of course march is a women's month and this entire month we will be conducting weekend webinars so please do sign up tell your friends to sign up speak out because we need to empower other girls other women to speak up and move ahead with us so that none is left behind because empowered women do what they empower other women so learn this when you are empowered what do you need to do empower other women yes empower other women that said uh, today's speakers we had first uh, the four speakers charita ravula uh, let me go to this yes charita ravula sanjana uh, pullaparthi hansika chennam setty aishwarya uh, arige and our uh, moderator event moderator is naini patala but last but not the least we have shruti keshri from india who presented their topics so thank you so much girls and congratulations what we wish you all is that um, let this be a path that that is ahead of you so that create it that others can follow you right so i want to go ahead and congratulate uh first of all charita ravula a big virtual clap to her if you all can uh, come on to the video yes a big virtual clap thanks thank you so much charita we will uh, mail this uh, ship this to you virtually then we have hansika chinnam setty a big virtual clap to you congratulations hansika chinnam setty on presenting your topic later we have aishwarya arike congratulations aishwarya a uh, big a uh, clap to you keep it going um uh, uh, we have shruti keshri a big virtual clap to you and uh, last but not the least our uh, star here sanjana pulaparthi um a big virtual clap to you sanjana 
Congratulations, all five of you girls and Naini, you did a great, wonderful job. If at all, you any of you want to be a moderator, please do sign up and we will coach you, help you because speaking skills, presenting skills uh, are really important in any of the STEM activities. You can be uh, extremely smart and intelligent, but if you are not able to communicate, you have lost it, right? So um, please do uh, sign up to be a part and also uh, to present or to moderate and spread the word. Finally, last but not the least, a happy International Women's Day for, to you all. Congratulations. And can you please unmute yourself and everyone come on video so that we can take a screenshot of all the presenters. I would request everyone to come on video. Change the view. Smile, girls. A few few people are still showing up on video. All right. Thank you so much. We still have three more weeks to go. The floor is all open for you all. Be encouraged, be inspired, and be an inspiration to others. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Said. Thank you, Naini. Good uh, presentations. We all enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Mr. Vijay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you madam. A nice presentation, all the presenters. Thank you, Dr. Rajni. Is possible in next week uh, in presentation in myself, ma'am? Yeah, please, ma'am. Uh, you have my number. You can definitely reach out to us. So and okay. please spread the word okay, so that okay, we can yeah we can encourage other women other girls uh, from AVS also yeah. we would request um, more girls mm -hmm. to come forward and present so that you can inspire girls especially in the developing and third world countries. Okay, definitely, madam. I send the message in my colleagues and my students also. Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Thank day. You.